Hello there, very good evening and welcome to the news tonight. I'm Tracy Shilshi, taking you through the day's top stories from India and across the world, starting with the headlines. E. Palani Sami takes oath as Tamil Nadu Chief Minister with a 31-member cabinet. Governor C. Vidyasagar Rao gives him 15 days to prove majority in the assembly. Campaigning for the third phase of the UP elections enters its last leg. Prime Minister Narendra Modi addresses election rallies in Hardoi and Barabanki district. Ministry of External Affairs spokesperson Vikas Swaroop is appointed the High Commissioner of India to Canada, replaces Vishnu Prakash, who retired in October 2016. And U.S. President Donald Trump meets Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, urges him to curb settlements but avoids endorsement of the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Our top story this evening, E. Palanisamy, AIDMK General Secretary V.K. Sasikala's loyalist, was today sworn in as Tamil Nadu Chief Minister by Governor C. Vidya Sagar Rao. He's been asked to prove his strength in the, house, uh, in the floor of the House in 15 days. Confirming the development earlier today, the AIDMK claimed that it was a victory for the party. Palani Sami was elected leader of AIDMK's legislative party by the Sasikala faction on Wednesday after the Supreme Court upheld the conviction of Sasikala in a disproportionate assets case. The decks were finally cleared for AIADMK Zeta Party Palani Swami on Thursday to assume the chief minister's post with a 31 member cabinet. Palani Swami became the state's third chief minister in the last three months. Replacing O Panir Selvam, whose portfolios have been allotted to other leaders. The governor will call the person who, as an outcome of the protest, establishes on the floor of the House that he has majority to form the government. And he has very him or her as Chief Minister. Governor C. Vidyasagar Rao gave Palaniswami 15 days to prove he has majority support in the state legislature. Palaniswami reportedly told the governor that he was ready for a vote of confidence immediately. He said he had the support of 124 AIADMK MLAs. I am glad the governor has broken the ice and taken the positive step of calling upon a person who appears to command the majority support of his party to form the government. But I would have personally liked a floor test to precede invitation to form the government. Palani Swami's elevation brings to an end the weeks-long drama that saw the party general secretary Shashikala being jailed in Bengaluru on Wednesday. Shashikala, whose bid to become chief minister ended with the Supreme Court verdict, will serve four years for corruption. Panir Selvam, who was asked to prove his claim by the governor on Wednesday, could not gather enough support within the party. Members of the Panir Selvam camp are expected to meet the election commission to challenge Sashikala's appointment as interim general secretary. The biggest roadblock in formation of a stable government in Tamil Nadu is Bharatiya Janta Party and Modi government. Why is it that Modi ji continues to destabilize elected government in the state? Is this the federal cooperation he used to speak about, where center will be a bully, an office of governor will be used as a puppet. It's time to uphold the constitution and the law, Mr. Governor and Shri Narendra Modi. The law is doing its own work and the constitutional system is doing its own work. जो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल प्रोविजन है उसके तहत जो है वो राजभवन और राज्यपाल जी काम कर रहे हैं इसलिए उसका इंतजार करना चाहिए और जो भी करेक्ट कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल सिस्टम है और जो संवैधानिक व्यवस्था है उसके तहत ही वहाँ पर होगा बिफोर गोइंग टू जेल शशिकला नॉट ओनली चोज पालनी स्वामी टू बी द चीफ मिनिस्टर बट ऑल्सो री इंडक्टेड टू ने इंक्लूडिंग टी टीवी दिनकरण एज द ए आई डीएम के डेप्यूटी जनरल सेक्रेटरी Vinakaran was expelled in 2011 by the late J. J. Lalita from the party. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. On to other news, and the Supreme Court on Thursday said that a five-judge constitution bench would be set up to hear and decide on a batch of petitions 
relating to the practice of triple talaq, nikah halala, and polygamy among Muslims. It said all of the petitions relate to constitutional issues and needed to be dealt by a larger bench. Headed by Chief Justice J.S. Kehar, the bench took on record three sets of issues and said the questions for consideration of the Constitution bench would be decided on the 30th of March. The bench has asked the parties concerned to file their respective written submissions by the next date of hearing. During the last hearing, the Apex Court had made it clear that it would not deal with the question on whether divorce under Muslim law needs to be supervised by courts as it fell under the legislative domain. Vikas Swaroop, who is currently serving as the spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs, was on Thursday appointed as High Commissioner of India to Canada. The post has been lying vacant after Vishnu Prakash retired in uh, October 2016. Swaroop is an officer of the IFS batch of 1986 and is famous for penning down the novel Q&A adapted in film as Slumdog Millionaire. He took over from Saeed Akbaruddin as the MEA spokesperson in April 2015. Swaroop will be replaced by Gopal Bagle, who is currently looking after Pakistan-Iran-Afghanistan affairs in the ministry. And now let's give you all the latest from the ongoing assembly elections. Curtains will come down tomorrow on the hectic campaigning in 69 assembly seats spread over 12 districts of Uttar Pradesh that will go to polls in the third phase on the 19th of February. A total of 2 crore voters will vote for the 826 candidates contesting in these elections. 105 women candidates are contesting the elections in the third phase. The 12 districts in the third phase include Farukabad, Haldoi, Kannauj, Manpuri, Etawa, Kanpur, Oraya, Lucknow, Sitapur and Barabanki. In the 2012 assembly polls, SP had won 55 of the 69 seats, while BSP, BJP and the Congress secured just 6, 5 and 2 respectively. One seat went to an independent. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Thursday said that his government is trying hard to push growth in India, but it cannot be done without the support of Uttar Pradesh. Modi addressed a public rally in Hardoi in Barabanki ahead of the third phase of voting, which take place on the, takes place on the 19th of February. And Chief Minister Akhilesh Yadav also highlighted schemes launched by his government and promised one lakh jobs in the police force without even an interview. Campaigning for the third phase of UP elections scheduled for Sunday has entered its last leg. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Thursday said he was an adopted son of Uttar Pradesh and vowed not to ditch the people of the state at a rally in Hardoi. He further added that his government is trying hard to push growth in India, but it cannot be done without UP. Modi also slammed the opposition, saying beat Congress, Samajwadi Party or BSP. No one thought about the development of the state. The PM also addressed an election rally in Barabanki district. Chai Congress ho, chai Sapa ho, chai Baspa ho. Pure Uttar Pradesh ka vikas kaise ho? Is par kabhi socha nahi gaya. Jo bhi aya. अपनी वोट बैंक संभालने में ही लगा रहा वोट बैंक संभालने में चीफ मिनिस्टर अखिलेश यादव एड्रेस रैलीज इन इटावा मैनपुरी एंड कन्नौज डिस्ट्रिक्ट्स स्पीकिंग एट द रैली इन मैनपुरी ही प्रॉमिस टू प्रोवाइड वन लाइक जॉब्स इन द पुलिस इफ हिज पार्टी गेट्स टू फॉर्म द गवर्नमेंट अगेन अखिलेश आल्सो हिट आउट एट द ऑपोजिशन पार्टीज मैनपुरी इज अ पार्लियामेंट्री कंस्टिट्यूएंसी रिप्रेजेंटेड बाय समाजवादी पार्टी फाउंडर मुलायम सिंह यादव इन लोकसभा आने वाली पीढ़ी के लिए ऐसी सड़क है जिस तरह लोग जीटी रोड को याद रखते हैं वैसे ये समाजवादी पार्टी की बनाई हुई सड़क अगले 200 साल 300 सौ साल चार साल तक लोग यही याद करते रहेंगे कि हाँ समाजवादियों ने कोई सड़क बनाई है इसलिए ये तो मैनपुरी मान लो अपना घर है ऑन दी अदर हैंड कांग्रेस वाइस प्रेसिडेंट राहुल गांधी ऑल्सो हेल्ड इलेक्शन मीटिंग इन थ्री डिफरेंट कंस्टिट्यूएंसी इंक्लूडिंग सीतापुर हरदोई एंड उन्नाव taking a jibe at the PM's farmer's loan waiver comment. Rahul said as PM of the country, Modi has the power to waive off the farmer's loans anyways. He also promised that the Congress will open free coaching centers for the youth in every city. Uttar Pradesh may make a new way to make a new way. The youth want to make a new way. The youth want to make a new way. The youth want to make a new way. आपके दिल में जो है 
उसको सुनकर उसको समझकर उत्तर प्रदेश के लिए काम करें मीन वाइल बीजेपी प्रेजिडेंट अमित शाह एंड होम मिनिस्टर राजनाथ सिंह ऑल्सो एड्रेस वेरियस रैलीज इन द पोल बाउंड स्टेट कांग्रेस लीडर गुलाम नबी आजाद ऑल्सो हेल्ड इन इलेक्शन रैलीज इन बाराबंकी एंड लखनऊ आजाद सेट दैट दी एस पी कांग्रेस अलायंस विल कंटिन्यू फॉर द टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन लोकसभा इलेक्शन ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट राज्यसभा टेलीविजन उत्तर प्रदेश चीफ मिनिस्टर अखिलेश यादव इज ऑल्सो टू कैंपेन फॉर सिस्टर इन लॉ अपर न यादव इज कंटेस्टिंग दीज असेंबली इलेक्शन फ्रॉम द लखनऊ कंटोनमेंट सीट ऑन द समाजवादी पार्टी टिकट setting aside the internal rift in the party samajwadi party mp dimple yadav the wife of akhilesh also sought votes for aparna yesterday standing alongside aparna dimple cited various development works taken undertaken by the samajwadi party government she also attacked the center over demonetization samajwadi party patriarch mulayam singh yadav too has made similar appeals to voters at his rallies to support aparna yadav Meanwhile Congress uh, Vice President Rahul Gandhi will be accompanied by his sister Priyanka Gandhi at an election rally in Raibareli tomorrow this will be her first campaign rally in these elections here are more updates in Polpuri Filing of nominations for the 7th and final phase of assembly elections in Uttar Pradesh ended today voting for this phase will be held on the 8th of March the scrutiny will be held on the 17th of February and the last day for withdrawal of nominations is Saturday February 18th The election commission on Thursday let off defense minister Manohar Parrikar with a light rap for his bribery remarks asking him to be more circumspect and careful in future. The EC also rejected Parrikar's claims that the CD carrying his remarks has been tampered with and that the translation of his statement from Konkani to English is faulty. The election commission has sent a team to Punjab to review the security arrangements for EVMs after the Aam Aadmi Party alleged breach of security. Chief Electoral Officer of Himachal Pradesh and the additional Chief Electoral Officer of Delhi will visit all the constituencies to interact with political parties. The team has been asked to submit its report by the 17th of February. With that, a quick break here. Up next, we're getting you the top international stories. This year, we have declared this campus as a net energy positive campus. In this campus, we have triple effect vapor oxygen machine. This is one of the highest efficient cooling systems we have. Target by 2022 is 100 gigawatt. If we achieve that, India will become a leader in green energy, and it will give the lesson to entire world. Watch Eureka with S K Singh, Director General, National Institute of Solar Energy, Guru Gram, only on Rajya Sabha Television. A labyrinth of hundreds of narrow stairway passages is a significant and historical component of what you popularly know as Bara Imam Bara. Some of these narrow stairways have dead ends, some end at precipitous drops, while others lead to entrance or exit points. Historically, Bhut Vilaya was constructed to confuse the enemy intruder, and the narrow lanes of the labyrinth can make anyone feel lost. The structure contains various strategically built hollows in the corridors. पांच राज्यों में चुनाव का धुआंधार प्रचार किसकी होगी जीत किसको मिलेगी हार कौन होगा विपक्ष में किसकी बनेगी सरकार देखिए राज्यसभा टेलीविजन पर पल पल की खबर लोकतंत्र दो The 
art of painting comes to us from the prehistoric period. Paintings are also a valuable source of information about their age. Like this depiction of the wedding procession of Dara Shiko. The elder son of Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan had a Mughal wedding with distinctive Indian elements. Like the veil he wears to the pomp and show of the Bharat in Hindu weddings. Welcome back. Uh, time now for all the international news and U.S. President Donald Trump has urged Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to curb settlement activity but avoided any explicit endorsement of a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The two-state policy has been a long-standing bedrock of U.S. Middle East policy. This was the first time the two leaders met since Trump's victory in the 2016 presidential elections. Palestinians have urged the White House not to abandon their goal of an independent state. Trump has vowed to work towards a peace deal between Israel and Palestine, but said it would require a compromise on both sides and it will be up to the parties themselves to reach an agreement. Netanyahu, on the other hand, said that there were certain conditions that needed to be met for any solution to be forged. So I'm looking at two state and one state, and I like the one that both parties like. I'm very happy with the one that both parties like. I can live with either one. Uh, I thought for a while the two-state looked like it may be the easier of the two. But honestly, if Bibi and if the Palestinians, if Israel and the Palestinians are, are happy, I'm happy with the one they like the best. Rather than deal with labels, I want to deal with substance. And it's something I've hoped to do uh, for years in a world that's absolutely fixated on labels and not on substance. So here's the substance. There are two prerequisites for peace that I laid out two years, several years ago. And they haven't changed. First, the Palestinians must recognize the Jewish state. They have to stop calling for Israel's destruction. They have to stop educating their people for Israel's destruction. Second, in any peace agreement, Israel must retain the overriding security control over the entire area west of the Jordan River, because if we don't, we know what will happen. Now, an inquiry into Australia heard that the country's Catholic Church has paid $276 million to victims of sexual abuse since 1980. The Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sex Abuse was told the money was divided between thousands of victims. The data released on Thursday showed the average payment per victim was 91,000 Australian dollars. Here's a report. Australia's Catholic Church has paid 276 million Australian dollars in compensation to thousands of child abuse victims since 1980. A government inquiry heard on Thursday. This was the first time the total compensation paid by the church's schools, orphanages and residences has been revealed. A report at a Royal Commission into Institutional Abuse said 3,066 victims had received some form of compensation from a Catholic body in the 35 years to 2015. Overall, Catholic Church authorities paid $276.1 million in response to claims of child sexual abuse received between 1 January 1980 and 28 February 2015. That sum include amounts of compensation, treatment, legal and other costs. Cash payments of 258.8 million Australian dollars amounted to an average $91,000 per person. Some compensation was in non-cash payments. The institution which paid the most was the Global Order Christian Brothers, which paid 45.5 million Australian dollars to 763 people averaging $61,000 per person. The Jesuits paid the most per complainant at $257,000 each on average. The earliest incidents of alleged abuse reported in a claim to a Catholic Church authority was in the 1920s. 
and the latest was after 2010. Between January 1980 and February 2015, 4,445 people alleged incidents of child sexual abuse in 4,765 claims. The Royal Commission, Australia's highest, most powerful type of inquiry which can compel witnesses and recommend prosecutions, has previously heard that 7% of priests working in Australia between 1950 and 2010 were accused of child sex crimes, but few were pursued. The report was based on analysis of data kept by Catholic Church authorities. The Royal Commission has been roundly praised by victim advocates as the most comprehensive public inquiry into child abuse. It is due to report back to the government in December. We've all known the truth for a long time, but it's nice that it's all coming out in the open that everyone else can understand how bad this organisation is. Australia's most senior Catholic Cardinal George Pell said last year the church had made enormous mistakes and catastrophic choices by refusing to believe abused children, shuffling abusive priests from parish to parish and over-relying on counselling of priests to solve the problem. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. At least 30 people were killed and over 100 injured in a suicide attack inside the Sufi shrine of Lal Shahbaz Kalandar in Sevan town of Pakistan. The blast took place during a Sufi ritual when hundreds of devotees were present inside the premises of the vast mausoleum of the saint. According to initial reports, it was a suicide bombing in a portion reserved for women in the shrine. Rescue officials believe that due to the non-availability of adequate ambulances at the shrine, the toll could rise. We'll keep an eye out on developments there and here are more international news updates in Global Buzz. Top diplomats of the G20 members today gathered in Germany's Bonn city, paving the way for the summit to take place in July this year. German Foreign Minister Sigmar Gabriel met his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi on the sidelines of the two-day summit. Among the various global challenges being discussed at the summit are the cooperation on climate change, global trade, conflicts in Syria, Yemen and Ukraine. The summit also marks the first interaction between newly appointed U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and his counterparts. Warplanes of the Saudi-led coalition struck a house north of Yemen's capital, Sana'a. The attack reportedly killed nine women, one child and left many others injured. The airstrike hit a house in the Arhab district, north of Sana'a, where mourners had gathered to offer condolences after a woman had died. In October, the alliance of mainly Gulf Arab states came under severe criticism after launching an airstrike on a funeral gathering in Sana'a that killed around 140 people. An amateur video uploaded online shows the Syrian city of Dera being shelled and bombed as the forces there attempt to drive rebels out of the city. Today is the third consecutive day when airstrikes hit the city. The clips uploaded on Wednesday and Tuesday showed the aftermath of strikes on Dera neighborhoods including the Al-Balad area. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights Monitor reported fierce clashes between the Syrian regime and rebels. There were however no immediate reports of deaths there. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres concluded his two-day visit to Egypt today. He also met Arab League Chief Ahmed Abdul Ghaid. During his visit, Guterres warned against abandoning the idea of a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, saying there was no alternative. And now let's get you all the updates from the Wall of Sports in Sportspeed. 33-year-old Dutch winger Arjen Robin was at the heart of Bayern Munich's attacking play in the 5-1 rout of Arsenal. The win has put the Champions League quarterfinals within Bayern's reach. Robin posed a constant threat to the Arsenal defence, crowning his performance with one of his trademark goals. Alexis Sanchez equalised for Arsenal, but Bayern continued their route with two more goals from Diego and one each from Robert Lewandowski and Thomas Müller.
Real Madrid are one step closer to a seven straight Champions League quarter final as goals from Karim Benzema, Tony Cross, and Casemiro sealed a 3 1 victory over Napoli on Wednesday. Lorenzo Insigne opened the scoring for Napoli after just eight minutes of the match starting, but Benzema soon headed home an equalizer. The second leg will be played on the 7th of March. ICC Chief Executive David Richardson has revealed that usage of the decision review system has enabled umpires to attain a staggering accuracy rate of 98.5%. He also said that another round of deliberations will happen during the first half of this year on working out a strategy for the inclusion of cricket in the Olympic Games. That's all we have for you on the news tonight from the entire team here. Good night. We'll see you again tomorrow.